Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're going to talk about being cooperative and the linguistic humour that comes when you're not. But first, our Patreon episode this month is about language games, language play, things like Pig Latin, Verlon, uh, rhyming slang, and other ways of moving around uh, bits and pieces of language and what that tells us about how language works. And also on the Patreon, we have a new supporter level, which is the Lingthusiasm Multipack. For a $20 a month subscription, you can have the opportunity to privately share bonus episodes with your students, or if you have a couple of broke friends and you want to share the Lingthusiasm bonus episode joy with them, this tier is a way that lets you do that in good conscience. And you also get to nominate topics and vote on future bonus episode topics. So you can find that and all the other levels of support that we have at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. So also this month, I did an interview on the linguistic podcast World in Words, where I talked about weird Twitter, uh, and especially the, the Twitter account of Johnny Sun, who's a very popular kind of weird Twitter account and some of the internet linguistic things that happened there. So we will link to that interview and you can listen to us on that podcast, which is also a linguistics podcast that you might like. They do beautiful stories about language and have been doing so for a long time. They have a massive collection of back episodes. They're part of PRI. We'll put a link to those in the show notes. Cool. So if you need something to do between your Lingthusiasm episodes, you can listen to them too. Let's talk about linguistic cooperation. Okay, we'll do it cooperatively as well. Cooperatively, yes, and. So when linguists talk about cooperation, there's a kind of very specific type of cooperative meaning that exists in linguistics. So let's do a model dialogue. Lauren, if I were to say to you, would you like some coffee? I would say coffee would keep me awake. And this could mean, depending on my knowledge of Lauren's time zone and her current desires and so on, that she might want coffee or she might not want coffee. So if it's in the morning and I desperately need to be alert for the start of the day, it would be really great that coffee keeps me awake. But if it's 11pm at night and I am known to not stay awake very late, probably would mean that I don't want coffee. And even though there's nothing in the linguistic content there to indicate clearly whether they desperately want coffee or do not want any caffeine right now, but we can tell from interaction, we can tell from the context and the person that we're speaking to whether that means a definitive yes or a definitive no, because we're doing something more complicated with understanding what's happening in that conversation than just looking at the words. And it's often used to be politer. So rather than saying, do you want coffee? Yup. You might say, do you want coffee? Oh, coffee would keep me awake. Like that would be a great favor that you could do for me. Or uh, coffee would keep me awake rather than saying no, which might be kind of blunt or rude. We do this all the time to stop hurting each other's feelings or to kind of soften the edges of an interaction. And it's not necessarily that communication is failing. It's that communication is more sophisticated than just looking at exactly the words people say and then exactly how they reply. And it can also be used to comedic effect in a lot of the examples we have of how this kind of cooperation works. We look at how it works by looking at when it's broken. And in comedy, it's often broken for amusement. Exactly. And it, sometimes it's also broken uh, to be annoying or it feels annoying when it's broken. So one of these is the classic, can I go to the washroom? I don't know. Can you? Oh, I hate this one so much. <laughs> It's the worst. It, but I always, like, I always find an opportunity to use it. It's very funny to use it. It's very frustrating to be on the receiving end of it. Yeah, and the thing is that's, that's frustrating about it is because the respondent is ignoring Gricean maxims in most circumstances, unless maybe you're a patient at a hospital who's just had some sort of operation where you're, like, not sure if you're allowed to, like, take yourself to the <laughs> bathroom. <laughs> then... You know, under most circumstances, the capability of someone's going to the bathroom is not in question. It's the uh, their permission to. And so we know that the relevant thing to assume there, the cooperative thing to assume there, is that this is what kind of question it is. 
And people deliberately choose the wrong definition of can to reply to. Yeah, and, you know, because it can be kind of fun to get someone's goat, but it's also hard to articulate, like, why this feels so annoying, why this feels so wrong. Um, So we are going to, in this episode, talk about, you know, what you can say that this person is is violating, what this person is flouting, what the problem is when someone says that, and how you can articulate to them how annoying they're being. And by not saying exactly what we mean, it can actually help move interactions onward. Yeah. And a lot of this has been really thought out and kind of codified as a set of ways of understanding how we navigate conversation. And uh, the, the person who's often given credit for kind of articulating this most clearly and whose work a lot of this is based on is Paul Grice, who is a linguist who was working on this in the, the 1960s, 1970s. He was a, a philosopher, but was very interested in the philosophy of language and semantics and meaning. And a lot of work on semantics happens kind of in this imaginary, context-free world, or, or used to. Semantics was this kind of not thinking at all about the context of how people use language. And Grice noticed that a lot of the time people don't say exactly what they mean, and that follows a set of conventions and that we kind of seek out being cooperative in how we talk. Yeah, and we have we have certain assumptions. We generally assume that people are trying to cooperate with us. We generally assume that people are trying to tell us something that's relevant and useful and cooperative to what our goals are in the conversation. That people are saying something for a reason. They're not just, you know, saying something totally irrelevant just to be annoying or just to be completely random. And they're saying a sufficient amount of stuff. So if you say a lot of things, there might be a reason why you're doing that. And if you don't give much information, then there's usually a reason for that as well. And so it's a way of understanding what's happening in those situations. And it's something that we acquire. So I was I was looking at some research for this episode and I came across a study that tested children on how well they were able to understand some of these Gricean maxims. And they tested four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds. And what they did is they have like a puppet. They have three puppets. Yeah. And they'd have one puppet saying something like, what games do you know? And then a, one of the puppets might say in response, I know how to play football. And another puppet might say, I know your name, which is the irrelevant response. Yeah. And so they'd ask the children, you know, which of these puppets is being cooperative or which of these puppets is being rude or which of these puppets is being saucy <laughs> um, and try to get them to pick. And so children who understood that you're supposed to give a relevant response to what games you know would pick the one that said they played football rather than the one that said they, they know your name because that's not a relevant response. And they found that four-year-olds generally had basically a chance understanding of of these things, which might mean they understood a few of them, but not enough for it to like show up significantly in the data. Uh, Five-year-olds seem to understand some kinds of cooperation, but not others. And uh, six-year-olds performed like adults. So it's a thing that happens kind of later in your development of language. You know, four-year-olds can can talk in complete sentences, but they don't necessarily have the social understanding that, that adults do. I feel really heartened that that there's research that shows that children struggle with these maxims, because I definitely remember as a child struggling with and having to learn how these work. I remember when I was about six, I was at a, I was at something with a bunch of people and an adult offered me some chips, like potato crisps out of a packet. And they were like, would you like some? And I was like, oh, I feel so embarrassed now that I understand how these things work. But at the time I was like, oh, don't, don't you like them? Are you like, don't you like the flavor of them? (laughs) (laughs) That's so considerate. Yeah. I was just like, if they're off, like if they're getting rid of these, like it's such a child thing. It's like, oh, if they don't want to eat them themselves, they must not like them. Um, (laughs) (laughs) If if I had the chance to eat the chips that I liked, I would just eat all. There's no way that I would share these if they were tasty. So they must not (laughs) think they're tasty. And I remember the adult had to like actually explain to me what they meant. <laughs> They're like, oh no, I just, um, I just thought that maybe you would like some because I like them, but I like sharing. Um, so I feel really heartened <laughs> that like it's a thing children don't automatically understand. And it can be hard, like when you're learning a new language, you may find it difficult to understand what the politeness expectations or cooperative expectations are in your language. Yeah, this happened to me actually when I was an adult, but I was just somewhere, I was traveling and I kept being like, why is no one inviting me to anything? Like, I feel kind of excluded. And it turned out that 
what people were doing was mentioning that events were happening. Right. And that I was supposed to get the inference that if I heard about an event, I should express interest in going. Whereas I was trying to like not intrude and not express interest in something unless I was being explicitly invited. Interesting. And so they thought I was very standoffish and didn't want to go. And I thought like no one wanted to invite me to anything. I know that some people who have autism express a difficulty with navigating the implicit meaning behind a lot of things that other people take for granted in terms of what is behind a lot of this cooperation principle. And so although we kind of talk about some people being annoying when they deliberately flout these things, there are some people for whom navigating these kind of implicit cooperative conversational strategies is really, really difficult. There's an example of that on Tumblr. There's a post that has been going around that says something along the lines of, I just realized that when you're doing something and someone asks you, what are you doing? What they're really asking you is, can I join you? Right. So if it's like, what game are you playing? They're trying to say like, and do you mind if I join you? Yeah. And so there's been various people going back and forth about, you know, what do people actually mean when they're saying this? And is this a kind of soft invitation or something like that? Yeah. So thinking about it and thinking about it overtly as a set of guiding principles for how you interact with people can also help some people to navigate them. Yeah, absolutely. And also sometimes, sometimes when they're really obvious, they can also be really funny. Yeah. And we're, <laughs> we're going to basically illustrate. So Grice breaks down the cooperative principle into like four potential ways that you can use these or, or flout and kind of not use them. And we're going to kind of work through them with some examples. But I think the important thing is sometimes they're talked about as rules. And I think that kind of makes it sound like it's a hard and fast. And if you don't use them, then you're breaking them and it's really bad. And I don't, want us to talk about it in that way. Yeah, and I think they're they're talked about as if they're rules, but they're really kind of baseline assumptions, and we flout them all the time. And what that is doing is just adding meaning beyond the baseline. Yeah. And because there's lots of non-baseline meanings that you can have. And so, you know, it's just it leveling up. I think of it as leveling up. And the other thing is, even though we're working through these four categories, I personally often find it difficult to categorize examples of people using or flouting these cooperative principles. And often examples don't neatly fit into one of these categories. Mm -hmm. So it's like helpful to think about that there are different categories and there are different ways of breaking them down because not all of them seem exactly the same thing. But really, anytime there's an extra layer of meaning, there's probably some way that that layer is being interpreted. And so, and a lot of them overlap a bit. The first one that comes up is what Grice calls the maximum of quality. And this one is like, I always forget that it's even there because it just seems pretty, it seems pretty obvious and it doesn't have as many like fun, uh, exciting jokes that play around with it. But the maximum of quality is like, generally we assume people are telling the truth. Yeah. And where this shows up sometimes is that Sometimes, like, obvious lying is not interpreted as, oh, this person, like, they're such a liar. It's interpreted as, oh, ha, I know, what I know what you mean. Yeah. And it's often used a lot in sarcasm. So, like, you say the opposite of what you mean. You're using this understanding of, like, I will obviously say the thing I mean, but if I use this particular tone of voice and I'm saying something that is obviously the opposite, I really do mean the thing, but I'm using sarcasm to highlight that. Like if someone falls down and you say, nice job, they're not going to be like, <laughs> why is this person congratulating me? They're going to be like, haha, very funny. You're being sarcastic. You're being very un, un nice. Um, I really like it when someone is clearly caught doing the wrong thing. And you're like, did, did, did you eat all the ice cream? And someone's there with the tub of ice cream in their hand and ice cream on their face. And they're like, no, <laughs> no, I, di I didn't eat it all. I just found this empty tub. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're like at someone's house and you're like, can I, do you mind if I get a glass of water? And like, there's no reasonable person that would refuse this request probably. And the person's just like, no. <laughs> and especially it's sometimes used in this case when like, no, because if, if there was some reason why you actually couldn't have a glass of water, like if they didn't have any cups or if their water had been turned off or something, you, you'd have to have an explanation. If you'd be like, well, oh my God, I'm so sorry, but actually this is what is going on. Yeah. You, you can't have a glass of water, but I have this other thing or something like that. Like you'd, you'd have to apologize if you couldn't do a very minor favor like that. But the bold no there is, is the kind of obvious lying. Yeah. My other favorite example of this is on Tumblr. Sometimes people will reply to a post, particularly in like the tags 
that they really, really like by saying, I hate this, or I'm dying, and it means I actually love it. Yeah. Because otherwise, why would you even reblog this so much if you hate it? Or if you did hate it, you'd have like a whole, you know, paragraphs about why it's problematic or something. You wouldn't just be like, in all caps, oh my god, this is terrible, I can't even. And it's a leveling up of your appreciation for something. So if you're like, oh yeah, I really like this, I really, really like this, I got to absolutely hate this, is like, I can't use any more superlatives, so I'm going to try this opposite strategy. Mm-hmm. So that is that is quality. The next principle, I'm not going to lie, like, you know, I, I like them all equally, but I really like quantity, this kind of rule of quantity, especially when it's misused for hijinks, which is to make what you say as informative as required, but it doesn't need to be more informative than is required for this interaction. Yeah. And that sounds that sounds very confusing, but there are some really amazing examples. Possibly my favorite, although, oh my God, there are so many good ones. <laughs> Possibly my favorite is there's a Wikipedia caption that you should definitely look at if you have not seen, which has a Scottish bagpiper at the South Pole whose name is Piper Care, and he's playing the bagpipes for a penguin who's standing next to him, which the caption calls an indifferent penguin. And so initially, this is what the caption said, you know, Piper Care plays a a tune for an indifferent penguin. And then someone went back and edited it. This is like, this is the gold of Wikipedia. Someone went back and edited it to to piper care right as in the person on the right plays the bagpipes for an indifferent penguin (laughs) and what i love about this is that it's entirely unnecessary right like it is way more informative than required to tell people which person in this (laughs) picture is the bagpiper and which person is the penguin because it's very clear which person is the bagpiper and which person is the penguin like if you can't tell the difference between a bagpiper and a penguin like you've got bigger problems than wikipedia captions can solve uh it's so good (laughs) but adding in the information about which side the piper is on implies that someone might have this difficulty but yeah like coming back and editing it to add it in (laughs) yeah and so it just it makes the caption so much fun. My other favorite is um, the, there was this video of this absolute like it's just this torrent of ducks walking in a procession along a road in like China or something, but just this absolute multitude of ducks. It's like a swarm of ducks, thousands of ducks. Yeah, <laughs> and someone has come along and tagged it, and they they're like, look at all these ducks. There are at least ten. <laughs> and then someone else comes along and just says, well, you're not wrong. And it's like, well, I mean, there are at least 10, but there are probably about, like, 300. But it's, it's true that there are at least 10 ducks, because there are definitely 10 there. There's definitely more than 10. But we have this feeling that it's somehow unsatisfying to be like, there are at least 10 ducks in this picture, because the person captioning it, it can very clearly see that this is not an informative caption. This is violating the maximum of, of quantity, and it makes it really funny. So I actually, I went back to find this GIF when we were researching this episode so that we can link you to it. And uh, apparently, (laughs) so I wrote an article about explaining how this this GIF interacts with Grice's Maxims a number of years ago. And this article that I wrote about the duck GIF is now cited on the Wikipedia article about the cooperative principle. (laughs) It is like a canonical example. It should not be the principle of quantity anymore. It should be the principle (laughs) of at least 10 ducks. (laughs) The at least 10 ducks principle. And it's... It's there under, uh, you know, violating these principles is often used for humor. And I was really excited because I was like, ooh, someone's compiled a list of like humorous examples of how this is being done. Like, I love this. I have a list. I want to add to my list. And then I go to the footnote. And it's like, oh, it's me. Oh, that was me. <laughs> sorry. You are so good at this. <laughs> so on the one hand, like I've arrived. But on the <laughs> other hand, <laughs> I don't get a new example. Uh, and you can flat this the other way. So you can be like, I have at literally a hundred million reasons why the cooperation principle is so good. Yeah, you can you can you can go up like I've told you once, I've told you a million times. Like, it's yeah. you know we understand hyperbole. Uh, one of the other ones that I really like is when people say greetings, Earthling, and you're like, <laughs> it is true that I'm an Earthling, but this seems really unsatisfying as a greeting. Like it's it's a funny greeting. Only reason that you would mention I'm an Earthling is if you were not. Yeah, the only reason that Earthling would be like a a useful quantity of information is that if you were not an Earthling, or if it was some people were not Earthlings. Yeah. And when we establish the colony on Mars, then maybe this example will no longer be good. A lot of these are kind of flouted weirdly in like advertising and commercials 
spaces where people are trying to give you information they think is cooperative and it comes across really uncooperative. And I love this on, there's an Australian show called The Checkout, which is about consumer rights, which sounds dry, but it's actually always historical and worth watching anyway. But they have a uh, segment regularly where they show these kinds of things. And one of my, fav- one of my favorites is um, a box of running shoes. And on the, on the box, it says average quantity two. <laughs> Like most boxes of shoes. <laughs> Which is the cor- the correct quantity of shoes, but not the correct quantity of information that is needed on this shoe box. It's actually <laughs> average. So I'll put, a, I'll, I'll put a link to that segment because they often have a lot of things where you're like, why would you be telling me this information? Yeah. And sometimes it's because it's too much, but also because it's not relevant. Yeah, so this brings us to the next maxim, which is called the maxim of relevance. And it's also, I don't know, like quantity may be your favorite. Relevance, I think, might be my favorite. Okay, sure. I'm glad we don't have to fight over them. It's like, it's so good. So one thing you can do, and this is mentioned by the webcomic XKCD. So XKCD points out that you can say on your cereal box, like, does not contain asbestos. And people will be like, ooh, I better buy that one. It does imply that all of the others somehow contain asbestos and are not telling us. Yeah. Like, it's somehow relevant to cereal, whether there's asbestos in it, whereas, like, that is not an ingredient of cereal. Or an example that I came across recently, real, real, real life example, was I bought some cheese, a mozzarella cheese, and it told me on the outside that there was no gluten in it. Gluten-free cheese. Does, does cheese usually contain gluten? No. Cheese is made out of milk. Okay, because I had I had like a moment of panic, and I was like, maybe cheese contains. Maybe I shouldn't have been feeding my friend cheese all this time. I I googled this just to be sure, and I ended up on a website for celiacs, and they were like, if you buy a cheese product, it might have gluten in it. Like it has like a powdered thing. Okay, you you sent me down a little like mini path of panic. Then when I was like, why are they mentioning this? They can only be mentioning this if like all other cheese has gluten in it. <laughs> no, but it like they they listed all of the common types of cheese, like the cheddar cheese and the mozzarella cheese and the Swiss cheese and they're like nope does not have gluten does not have gluten does not have gluten so but now you're standing in the grocery store and you're like your gluten-free friend is coming over and you're like well I better buy this cheese because it says it doesn't have gluten in it but I can't buy this other one because maybe it does maybe it does on the flip side I always love when you get like a packet of like salted peanuts and on the back it says may contain traces of nuts and you're just like I don't like it's possibly not relevant for this product I can imagine it's relevant for all their other products that are made on the same machine and don't have nuts yeah. as the primary ingredient. Well, and in fact, it's not even just may contain traces of nuts. It does contain nuts. That's yeah. the whole point. It, it very much contains almost exclusively nuts. Yeah. Another example of this is, so there was a Twitter account a number of years ago, which was a bookstore called Waterstones Oxford Street. And they were really funny. And they kind of stopped updating, but they had some really great tweets at the time. And they tweeted about some sort of contest that they were in. Yeah. And they suggested that people, if anybody wants to send some not poisoned gift baskets to the other contestants, (laughs) you know, you should feel free to do that. That's very kind of them. Right. And so you get this interpretation of like, they're, they're secretly trying to egg people on to poison their competitors. And of course, the whole thing's a joke. But you know, the, the fact that you get from not poisoned, actually poisoned. Yeah. Because normally when you say, if you'd like to send your friends some gift baskets you don't have to specify that they're not poison that just goes without saying like you don't poison gift baskets the default meaning is non-poisoned like the default state of a gift basket is unpoisoned definitely in english not so much in german but definitely in english (laughs) Ooh, good point german word for for poison is gift yeah, so like putting negatives in places suddenly adds a completely or, or putting in information that seems completely irrelevant suddenly is by the principle of cooperation, relevant. I have another really great example of that. This is, yes, yeah, this is my favorite one um, from the BBC radio comedy uh, series Cabin Pressure, which has a lot of really fun humor. And they're writing a test. And before the test happens, one of the characters is like, I'm really nervous about this test. Like, I'm not sure what's going to be on it. Like, I'm, I'm stressing about it. And he's talking with the guy. So Arthur's the one that's writing the test. And he's talking with the guy that's going to be administering the test. Yep. And the guy that's administering the test says... Shall I tell you an interesting fact? (laughs) Here's this number that you might want to know. And Arthur's like, that's not very interesting. And the test administrator's like, it's it's very interesting. If I were a young lad studying for an exam, I'd find it very interesting. And Arthur's like, oh, it might come up. And then the the test guy's like, oh, I'm I'm not telling you that. I'm just saying it's 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 interesting. And then Arthur's like, well, thanks. I just don't think it's very interesting. 
Oh, poor Arthur. <laughs> yeah, poor Arthur. Uh, Arthur doesn't really get Gricean maxims. So, you know, it's like, why is it relevant to all of the blue suddenly come up with this statistic? Well, clearly because he is trying to apply that it's going to be on the test. Yeah, paying attention to assuming things are relevant uh, is yeah. a, it's definitely a good pro tip for being cooperative. Well, and the cool thing about this in, in conversation is that we do this all the time without even thinking about it, that stuff is relevant. So if, for example, I say, do you want a cup of coffee? And you say, coffee will keep me awake. The way that I'm able to interpret that is I assume that the awakeness properties of coffee are relevant to why you would or wouldn't want to drink it. Yeah. Which brings us to the final maxim, which is about manner, which basically means that it's not just what you say, it's the way in which you say it can provide a specific kind of information that's relevant to whatever conversation that you're having. Yeah. And so this kind of breaks down into if you're being excessively wordy, there's probably a reason for it. Or if you're being, you know, if you're saying something that looks unclear, you're probably doing it for a reason. Yeah. Can I share the, the like canonical yeah. example that I remember from undergrad? Sure. So this is from Steve Levinson's work, which builds on a lot of what Grice did looking at how we're polite, because a lot of this is like, if you use or manipulate these cooperative principles, uh, it's often because you're trying to be more or less polite in a conversation. And Stephen Levinson's work builds on a lot of this in terms of politeness. And he has an example from his 83 book, which is um, maybe shows that he's a classier individual than I am. But the example is, I heard you went to the opera last night. How was the lead singer? And the, the other person replies, the singer produced a series of sounds corresponding closely to the score of an aria from Rigoletto. <laughs> That's so rude. <laughs> it's so rude. But the thing is, like, there's nothing overtly. The person didn't say the singer was really bad. Yeah. But because they didn't overtly say the singer was good, but they kind of did this very long-winded they did the thing, which was more or less the thing. There, there was only one way to read this. You know, or like, how was the movie last night? <laughs> like, well, it was a movie. You're like, I guess you didn't like it then. Yeah. So the way in which you say something can add a particular meaning. And one of my favorite authors who, you know, manipulates a lot of these kinds of maxims is Lemony Snicket, who writes a series of unfortunate events. Yeah. And there's a quote from him describing one of his characters saying, she was entirely dressed in articles of clothing and had nothing on her feet except a pair of socks and two shoes. No, 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 wait, what? That, that is what you have on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> like, what else do you normally have on your feet? You could wear a toe ring if you wanted to, I guess. But, like, normally. I mean, there's a bit of relevance going on here. Because you're like, should she have skis on? Yeah. Flippers? But yeah, there's some, there's some manner here where you're like, the fact that you, you specified this in a, in a very elaborate sort of way, you know, shows up for this sometimes. There's a really nice set from your blog, funnily enough, that kind of touches on ambiguity, but also manipulates these cooperative principles quite nicely, which are ambiguous job recommendations mm. so if you have to write a letter of recommendation for someone you've fired and perhaps don't really like we'll have a link to these and you can see how they are deliberately well phrased in their manner to kind of uh, not imply what they really mean so for an, a chronically absent employee you can say a man like him is is hard to find and you're deliberately playing with the manner of what is expected in a job recommendation to convey the opposite of what you really mean. Or, for example, if you say something like, you know, this person always showed up to the office, you know, more or less on time and was wearing clothing. <laughs> you know, this is not, these are good traits to have at a job. Yeah. But they're not sufficient to actually be good at it, you know. But this is also relevance because it shouldn't be relevant in a job recommendation letter that the person wore clothing to the workplace because that's assumed. So they do, they overlap a lot. Yes, they do indeed. So that brings us through the four. So the quality of what you say, whether you would generally assume that someone's telling the truth, um, the quantity of what you say. So you give as much information as you need to and no more. And the maximum of relation, which is that what you say has to be relevant to the particular interaction and then manner so how you say it which are kind of very broad summaries of these one of the fun things about the maxim of manner is that it's sometimes phrased in a way that deliberately breaks it i think for uh for fun so it's sometimes phrased as be perspicuous <laughs> and 
<laughs> Which is so really not very cool. useful because you're like, what does perspicuous mean? I had to look this up. Um, <laughs> but it means don't do this thing. Be clear. Yeah. So it's a self, self-flouting self maxim there. Or like if you're using words that are like deliberately more elaborate than... Then, or, or another another version of it is be brief, which can also be phrased as avoid unnecessary prolixity, which yeah. basically kind of defines itself. So, but it, it, again, it's it's not so much like this is what you should do all the time as this is what we generally assume people are doing. So, if you're if you're flouting it, then it's it's for some sort of reason, like you want to convey that you don't actually like the thing. I like people describe it as like they're not so much rules for the speaker as guidelines for the listener. Like as listeners, we're trying mm. to make sense of what people are saying based on it being true and relevant and sufficient. So that's a nice a nice. They're not like hard and fast rules that you must obey to to language, but they do show how important content. You know, we're big fans always on the show about like language use is is often as much about context as it is about grammatical structures and about kind of working with people cooperatively in interaction. And there's such a nice illustration of that. I think one of the examples that I've gone back to of, of kind of Gracie and Maxim's working in tandem from when I was an undergrad was if somebody says, I'm out of gas, you could say, oh, there's a gas station two miles up the road. Yeah. And that would be a generally a very helpful cooperative response. But it would not be a cooperative response if you knew that the gas station was closed or if you knew that there was actually another one that was <laughs> up one mile away instead of two miles. So why are you directing people to the further one? Yeah. Or if you knew that, um, you know, that you if you had some gas on you right now and you were like, yeah, I'm not sharing this, like, go, <laughs> go to that other one. Yeah. So, you know, it depends on the context for whether something is a, is a cooperative response or not as well. We have a few, um, if you, because I find with these things, like I find some people's descriptions or explanations for certain bits and pieces make more sense to me. So we have links to a bunch of different video clips that describe the maxims and how they work. And there's there's a lot of Gricene humor, but I don't know if there's a, if there are a lot of Gricene memes. But one that I do know of is somebody rewrote the song Amazing Grace to be Amazing Grace on Specgram. So we will link to Specgram as well if you would like to sing the praises <laughs> of the price. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include language games, hypercorrections, behind-the-scenes look at doggo speak, and how to explain linguistics to employers as well as a bunch of others. And you can help pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our producer is Claire and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!